We are fortunate that tonight's presentation by Dr. Henza is generously supported by the Master of Liberal Studies Alumni Association. I would like to thank them for bringing our writer, teacher, believer, and runner here tonight and ask you to join me in welcoming him to the podium. Thank you very much for this uh, very generous introduction. I had no idea that there was an introduction now. <laughs> the question is, uh, who am I going to introduce now? I don't know, perhaps the Jewish Jesus or something. <laughs> um, so it is true, I am on the faculty. Um, I am a professor in the Department of Religion. This is my 21st year at Rice. Um, it's an amazing story. I was offered the tenure track position when I was seven. <laughs> um, I've done uh, many things mostly having to do with Second Temple Judaism. Uh, so for example, in 2008-2009, the uh, Houston Museum of Natural Science hosted a, a fabulous exhibit. I was invited to be a guest curator um, on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And at the time, I gave um, various talks at the museum in synagogues and in churches all over Houston. And at some point, my very dear friend and colleague, Professor John Bowles from the History Department, who, by the way, just wrote a brilliant biography of Jefferson that you should all read, stopped me in the hallway and said to me, Matthias, do you know that you talk about two of the three most popular topics? And I said, no. I don't. What are they? And he said, well, the historical Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. To which I said, John, that's great, but now you've got me all worried. Two out of three, what am I missing? <laughs> and without any hesitation, he said, Elvis. <laughs> So I hate to say that Elvis did not make it into the book. <laughs> this is not my last word. I haven't quite worked out how to bring Elvis into the but I'll try hard. Next time, I'll, I'll make it work. So I will try to keep my remarks tonight to half an hour, famous last words. And I want to do the following. I'll start out by reading a couple of pages from the introduction. Um, there are many people in this room whose papers I have graded and written really not so nice remarks in the margin, so now it's your payback time. <laughs> then I'll talk a little bit about the book and why I wrote it, what was the true motivation behind it, and what it is I'm trying to bring across. Then I'll read another short section from the book, and then I end with a request of all of you, but we keep that to the end. So let me start out by reading to you just the first three pages of the book, the very, of the very introduction. <coughs> As a teenager growing up in Hanover in northern Germany, I developed an interest in early Christianity and began to read the Bible. One day, as I was browsing in a local bookstore, I saw an announcement that Shalom Ben Churin was coming to town to give a public lecture on Jesus. Shalom Ben Churin was a Jewish journalist and scholar living in Jerusalem who frequently returned to his native Germany to give talks and to teach classes. Over the years, Ben Churin became instrumental in initiating the, the German-Jewish dialogue after the Holocaust. According to the announcement, his talk was titled, Brother Jesus, the Nazarene through Jewish Eyes. Some years later, Ben Churin would publish a book with the same title. Since I had never heard a presentation by a Jewish scholar, let alone on Jesus, I became very excited and realized that this would be a special event I had to attend. The auditorium was packed that evening and the audience was clearly mesmerized. I don't remember many of the details of the talk, but I do remember that the evening made a lasting impression on me. Shalom Ben Turin was a soft-spoken and mild-mannered uh, was soft-spoken and mild-mannered and obviously deeply learned. The Holocaust was still in living memory only 40 years prior. The scars of the war were everywhere. Here was a Jewish scholar who had come all the way from Israel and who stretched out his hand as a demonstrative gesture of reconciliation. Ben Churin had come to study with us. There was not a trace of reproach or accusation in his presentation, only the desire to move on, to study together, and to read the New Testament from a Jewish perspective. 
I had never seen anything quite like this. And judging by the reaction from the audience, I was not alone. But it was not just the particular situation of learning from a Jewish scholar in post-war Germany that moved me. As I listened to Shalom Ben Churin, it occurred to me how little I knew about the world of Jesus, in spite of having studied the New Testament. Jesus was fully immersed in the Jewish world of his time, but I did not recognize or understand much of that world. It seemed foreign to me remote. I did not recognize the Judaism of Jesus because all I knew was the Old Testament. But the religion of the Old Testament is not the Judaism of Jesus. While in the New Testament Jesus studies and teaches in the synagogues, there are no synagogues in the Old Testament. While in the New Testament Jesus' disciples call him rabbi, there are no rabbis in the Old Testament. While in the New Testament, Jesus is often involved in conversations with the Pharisees, there are no Pharisees in the, New Testament, in the Old Testament. While in the New Testament, Jesus expels demons and unclean spirits, there are no demons in the Old Testament. The list goes on. These are not incidental matters in the life of Jesus. They all stem from the Jewish world to which Jesus belonged, a world about which I knew so little apart from what I had read in the New Testament. I felt I was rather ill-equipped to be an informed reader of the Bible, whereas for Shalom Ben Turin, there was nothing strange about this. Clearly, he did not need to be told what a synagogue was, or a rabbi, or who the Pharisees were. To the contrary, he was intimately familiar with the world of his brother Jesus. There's something unsettling about coming to realize that the person who stands at the center of the Christian faith, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph and Mary, was not a Christian, but a Jew. For me, it did not help much to recognize how little I knew of Jesus' own religious background. If I didn't understand ancient Judaism very well, how could I understand Jesus? It was much more comfortable to think of Jesus as one of us, somebody who was exactly like we are today, sharing the same theology, the same political points of view, and certainly the same religion. As I once heard it put, God created humankind in God's image, and we are quick to return the favor. <laughs> we like to think of God and of Jesus as if they are just like us, in this reading, there's nothing strange or surprising about the Bible because we have turned the Bible into a mirror in which all we can see is ourselves. But what we cannot see is what is actually there. Synagogues, rabbis, the Sabbath, Pharisees, demons, and the resurrection. In short, the world of Jesus. For the longest time, I was under the impression that this is the reason why the Christian Bible has two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. I simply assumed that the Old Testament was the Jewish part of the Christian Bible and the New Testament was the Christian part. The purpose of the Old Testament was to explain Judaism to Christians. Whenever we read in the New Testament of Jesus' Judaism, we could simply turn to the Old Testament and there, somewhere, we simply uh, we would find an explanation of the Jewish world of Jesus. The only problem was that I never seemed to be able to find the relevant passages in the Old Testament. What I found didn't really explain what I was looking for. Surely, I thought, the reason was my insufficient knowledge of the Bible. I was simply looking in the wrong places. Only later did I realize that the mistake was not mine. I was looking for passages about synagogues and rabbis and Pharisees that simply don't exist. The Old Testament cannot explain the Jewish world of Jesus. So why is that? Why is it that the Old Testament cannot explain the Jewish world of Jesus? And for that, I need to give you a little bit of background. And so we do a, a 10 minute mini class of uh, uh, biblical studies. 
So the first thing to say is that the Christian Bible consists of two parts, obviously. We all know this, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And both the Old Testament and the New Testament are not single books, they are libraries. And each of these libraries were written over a long period of time by many people. That's where the similarities end. Then things become very different. So the New Testament, start out with the New Testament, was written over a period of about 50 years. The first author of the New Testament is the Apostle Paul, who wrote in the 50s. And the last book, the book of Revelation, dates roughly to the year 100. So what we call the New Testament is a collection of writings that was written over a span of 50 years, from the year 50 to the year 100. There are other Christian writings after that, of course, but the New Testament more or less was finished around the year 100. So how about the Old Testament? The Old Testament was written over a much longer period of time. There is some debate about when the earliest texts were written. Some scholars date them to about the 12th century BCE, before the Common Era. Others will say the 11th century. By the year 1000 or so, we reach uh, the time of King David. There, at the very, very latest, the oldest texts were written. We're somewhat better informed about the youngest book in the Bible. That's the book of Daniel, and it dates to the second century of the Common Era. So if we take an expansive view of this, the Old Testament was written over a period of about 1,000 years, from 1200 BCE to 200. If we're a little more conservative, we say from the 11th century to the second century. That's still 900 years. That's a long period of time. The next thing you need to know is how we divide those 900 or 1,000 years. The single most important event in the history of ancient Israel was the destruction of Jerusalem by the Neo-Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. That happened in the 6th century. In 587, 586, Nebuchadnezzar launched a second campaign against Jerusalem, laid siege to the city, destroyed it, and brought the majority of the population into exile. That we call the Babylonian exile. The Babylonians were defeated by the Persians. The Persians allowed all the peoples whom Nebuchadnezzar had exiled to return home, among them the Israelites. Some of them did, though not all. They rebuilt the temple. And so what the Babylonian exile does is it divides the history that we associate with the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament into two parts. The first temple period and the second temple period. The first temple was built by King Solomon in the 10th century and destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in the 6th century. The second temple was inaugurated in March of 515 and was destroyed in the year 70 by the Romans. So what I want you to take away, there will be a quiz after this, <laughs> where I ask you to repeat all of these dates in reverse order. <laughs> Seriously, what I want you to take away is this term, Second Temple Period. So when were the books of the Bible written? Don't worry, I won't go through all of them. Much of what we call the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament reached more or less the form that we have right now during the Babylonian exile or shortly thereafter. There were some books that were written during the fourth century that made it into our Bibles. And I've listed them here for you. Ezra and Nehemiah are two books, in the Hebrew tradition they're actually one book, that talk about the return of various families from the Babylonian exile. First and Second Chronicles, another history book, repeating the history of ancient Israel up to the Babylonian exile. The book of Esther is set in the Persian Empire. Esther is a Jewish princess who rises to become queen of uh, Persia. Ecclesiastes or Kohelet is a wisdom book, much like the book of Proverbs. And then some people will say that there are some Psalms that were written early on in the Second Temple period. Those are the last books that made it into the Hebrew Bible. And then there's only one other book that I mentioned earlier on, namely the book of Daniel, which we can date with some certainty to the second century BCE. So really what I want you to see here is that there's a first temple period during which much of the Old Testament was written, and a second temple period, you have some literature here, and the book of Daniel, but then really 
nothing. I think everything I've said so far is pretty mainstream biblical scholarship. I would say 90% of my colleagues will agree with this. There are some outliers, of course, but I think that's pretty standard. Now, I want to make three observations here that will lead up to my thesis where things become perhaps a little more interesting. So the first thing I want you to see is that if the New Testament was written at this time here, right, we said about 50 to 100, there is, in fact, a pretty sizable gap in the middle between the 4th century and the 1st century. Uh, 400 years, give or take, where all we have is the book of Daniel, but really nothing else, at least not in the Bible. There's a significant divide, a chronological divide, between the Old Testament and the New. That raises the question, were there any Jews around during the time? Yeah? Did they write anything? A ton. <laughs> is it in the Bible? No. So what that means is that what we have in the Bible is a rather incomplete record of the literature that was in circulation in ancient Israel. At the time, people were reading all kinds of books. So if you, had, if you could time travel and you had a conversation with Jesus, and you would ask Jesus, hey, what did you read last night before you went to bed? Chances are Jesus would give you a name of a book that you've never heard of before. So the literature of ancient Israel is much more expansive, it's much more diversified, it's much broader than what we have in our Bibles. That's what I'm saying. The Bible gives us a slim excerpt of the literature that was in circulation at the time. My second observation is that the religion of ancient Israel changed dramatically over the centuries. It certainly changed during the Second Temple period. So we start out with the Persians who defeated the Babylonians. The Persians in the fourth century were then defeated by the Greeks. Hellenism, Greek culture took hold of this. Then there was a brief period of 100 years where Israel was independent under people we call the Hasmoneans or the Maccabees. And then the Romans came in in 63. So Israel was almost always subject to some other nation, was loyal to some other nation, and that changed the political and the sociological landscape. It was a time of tremendous changes. But even within Israel, things began to change. The word of God was thought of during the first temple period as an oral word. God speaks directly to the prophet Isaiah. During the second temple period, the word of God comes a written word. It is written down, and that will ultimately lead to what we call the Bible. So with it came social institutions. The scribe became a very important office. Rabbis, the synagogue, all of this were inventions, new religious institutions that came into being during the Second Temple period. And then finally, a lot of new ideas were introduced into the religion of ancient Israel. What happens to you when you die? Is there life after death? Is there any kind of reward for being good and punishment for being bad? If you read through the Old Testament, through all the texts that were written during the first temple period, there's surprisingly little about this. Let's talk about the book of Psalms. There are lots of people who are close to death. They talk about what will happen to me when I go down to Sheol, to the netherworld. They always stop short of asking the question, what happens after I die? There's a limited interest in cosmology and angels in the Hebrew Bible. All of this changes dramatically during the last 300 years of the first millennium BCE, where these questions become very pronounced. So what I'm trying to get at is that the religion of ancient Israel during the Second Temple period changed dramatically. And my third observation, first observation is there's a gap. My second observation is things changed dramatically. And my third and final observation is that scholars have always disliked this period. Scholars for a long time did not like the Second Temple period for a number of complicated reasons. They always preferred the First Temple. This is when the major books of the Old Testament were written, the Torah, 
prophet Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And there's the sort of the late stuff. It's not so interesting. And people didn't really like it. Also, the fact that not so much literature from the Second Temple period made into the Bible didn't really help. And this rather pejorative or negative perception of the Second Temple period began to change in the middle of the 20th century for a number of reasons, one of them being the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1940s and 50s that generated enormous energy. Some was just hype, but some was really fruitful energy that caused people to rethink and brought, as I said, a lot of energy to this period. It's one of the reasons why I came to the United States. So this happened in the second half of the 20th century. I was in, as you heard, in Heidelberg at the time, and I knew that there were scholars here working on this. So I came to the States to study with people this period. I wanted to know what's the fuss all about, about the Second Temple period. And then I became a scholar of this period myself. All right, so what does all of this have to do with Jesus? I asked the question, why does the Old Testament not explain the Judaism of Jesus? That's how we left off when I read my, it's, I know, it's a long time ago. It doesn't matter, just, just go. So why does the Old Testament not explain the Judaism of Jesus? And the reason for that is that the books of the Old Testament were written many, many centuries earlier on. And the religion of ancient Israel underwent significant changes. And by the time we come to the first century of the Common Era, the religion had changed completely. Let's do a thought experiment. Let's assume that you welcome a guest to the United States who's never been here. And so you lead her around, and she sees the high rises in downtown, and she sees the ethnic diversity of Houston, and she sees all the technology, the iPhones and the iPads. And whatever. She's just completely overwhelmed. And at that point, you turn to her and you say, don't you worry, just read the Constitution and everything will be clear. <laughs> so the rough equivalence is that the Old Testament at the time of the New Testament was, of course, still the foundational text. It was still authoritative. I'm not diminishing this at all. But a lot has happened in between. A lot has happened in between, and the Old Testament alone will not explain to us those changes. So what do we do? What do we do? Where do we get access to these, other, to these changes? Which texts do talk about this? And the answer is that there are many texts that were written during the Second Temple period, but they're not part of our Bibles. And so how do we learn about the Judaism of Jesus? We learn about the Judaism of Jesus by reading beyond the biblical corpus. We read the texts that were written during the gap years, during these years, of which there are many. And they survive through all kinds of circumstances. Parts are in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Others we call the Apocrypha, part of the Septuagint. Then there are even weirder texts called the Pseudepigrapha. It's what keeps people like me off the street. Once we read these texts, we learn a great deal about the changes that happened towards the end of the Second Temple period. And with that in mind, I want to read another couple of pages. These are pages 49 and 50 from the book. The Old Testament was written over a period of roughly a millennium, from the 12th to the 2nd century before the Common Era. It ended with the Second Temple period. German scholars of the 19th century called Judaism of the late Second Temple period Spätjudentum, or late Judaism, a term they chose deliberately. It was intended to denigrate Judaism of the late biblical era and to portray it as a late, degenerate, and lifeless form of Judaism. In their opinion, by the time we get to the end of the Second Temple period, there's nothing left of the pure origins of the ancient Israelite religions, which these scholars saw most clearly embodied in the biblical prophets of the first temple period. The term late Judaism was intended to leave no doubt that Israel had run its course and that whatever remained of it by the second temple period was soon to give way to Christianity, the true religion that infused the faithful again with a new spirituality. 
Soon Christianity would replace Judaism, a decrepit religion that had rendered itself obsolete. This negative perception of the Second Temple period prevailed long into the 20th century, even after its obvious anti-Jewish connotations had been recognized, and in some circles it is alive and well today. The reasons for this negative view of Second Temple Judaism are complex. Lingering anti-Jewish sentiments, particularly among European Protestant theologians, certainly played a role, as did a general lack of knowledge about the late biblical period. The gap in the literary record of the Protestant Bible that largely glosses over 400 years of ancient Jewish writings contributed to some misconceptions about Second Temple Judaism. More recently, the perception of Second Temple Judaism has begun to change, and the significance of the changes that took place during this time is increasingly recognized. Historically speaking, the Second Temple period was the time when the diaspora became a permanent reality, when the first synagogues were founded, and when the new religious offices of the scribe and the rabbi emerged. Equally important were the changes that affected Israel's literature. A new class of highly trained scribes collected and copied the Jewish scriptures, a process that would ultimately lead to the formation of the Bible. The last books of the Old Testament were written, several of them in the 4th century BCE and the book of Daniel in the 2nd century BCE. The oldest biblical manuscripts date from this period, from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Scribes produced the first translation of Jewish scriptures, the Septuagint. They interpreted scripture and created new literary genres, such as the tales of the diaspora and the apocalypse. And, most importantly for our purposes, Jewish authors of the late Ju Second Temple period produced a wealth of new books and introduced a host of new topics into the religious debates, ideas that changed Israel forever. All of these ideas are picked up again and discussed extensively in the writings of the rabbis some centuries later. A century ago, scholars could not see the tremendous energy and innovative spirit of this remarkable period. They were quick to dismiss Second Temple Judaism as spät Judentum, a late form of Judaism that, they argued, Jesus overcame. In the chapters that follow, I propose a dramatically different interpretation of the same period and of Jesus' place in it. Instead of writing off Second Temple Judaism as stagnant and obsolete, I will argue for its vibrancy and show its unique significance in the history of Judaism. And instead of posing Jesus in opposition to contemporary Judaism, I will argue that Jesus was deeply immersed in the Judaism of his time. When the texts of the New Testament are read in tandem with the Jewish books I've introduced in this chapter, the extent to which Jesus was an active participant in the religious debates of his time will become obvious. The Jewish world of Jesus is none other than the world of late Second Temple Judaism. So what do I actually do in this book? There are two introductory chapters. The first is just a historical overview where I do a little more in detail what I've just done with you. And I go particularly through the Second Temple period, briefly summarize what happens and what the different periods are and when these books are written. And in the second introductory chapter, I fill in the gap. And I introduce five different writings that were written in between the third um, century BCE and the first century of the Common Era. There's a wealth of literature that informs us very well, in fact, about the changes that happened in ancient Israel. It's just that we don't know these texts as well because they're not part of our Bibles. And then there are four main chapters in this book, and they are devoted to four topics, really, in the life of Jesus. The first is about messianism or messianic expectations. Jews had the expectation that a messiah would come at the end of time. And what I do there is I talk about, summarize these messianic expectations and compare them with descriptions of Jesus in the New Testament. The second chapter is about demons and evil spirits. 
my personal favorite. Who doesn't like a, like a good demon? And there I start out by talking about some of the exorcism stories in the New Testament that figure very prominently in the Gospels, in the Gospel of Mark. That's the first thing that Jesus does is expels a demon. And I asked the question, what's the significance here? Where do, do these demons come from? I said earlier on, they are never mentioned in the Old Testament. There are no such demons there. Where do they come from? What do they represent? And why are they so important for the evangelists? The third chapter is devoted to the Torah and the debate about the significance of the Torah. There's a widespread misconception among Christians that Jesus got rid of the Torah, sort of rendered the law obsolete. Nothing could be further from the truth. But rather, the discussions that Jesus has with the Pharisees about the correct interpretation of the law are really to be interpreted as part of a larger ongoing discussion about the significance of the law in Judaism at the time, which goes on to this very day. And then the last chapter is devoted to the resurrection of the dead and life among the angels. Again, resurrection is not exactly a minor topic in Christianity. Paul says very poignantly in 1 Corinthians 15, if for this life only we hope, then we are the most to be pitied. He says the Christian faith is all about the resurrection, cannot be easily written off. So the question then is, where does the faith in the resurrection come from? Again, there is no explicit resurrection in the Old Testament. Uh, the belief in the bodily, the physical resurrection is mentioned for the first time in ancient Judaism in the last chapter in the book of Daniel, in chapter 12. Um, but before that, there is really no uh, belief in the corporal, a physical resurrection of the dead. So again, these are four topics, messianism, demons and evil spirits, the right interpretation of the Torah, and the belief in the resurrection that I pick up from the New Testament and then trace their origin into the, what some people call intertestamental literature the Jewish writings that are not part of the Bible. All right, I close with a request. My request to you is to help me get the word out about the book. If you don't like it, don't. <laughs> <laughs> but if you like the book, I know that you're all extremely active on social media. I can just tell by your expression that you spend half of your days on Facebook. Um, help me get the word out. Uh, and so that people know about the books. The first time I've written a book for a general audience, and so I'm not so terribly interested in what my colleagues have to say. I'm very interested in what people like you have to say. So I leave it with that. Thank you very much. <laughs>